6 o'clock, I had watched my first video, I noticed this fucking video popped up here. Grateful fucking toaster. So apparently you guys are going to watch it with me. If you haven't seen this fucking movie, go fucking watch it. I was absolutely obsessed with a brave little toaster as a kid. I still am, <laughs> in my own weird way. But there's playing with this pig. Since I first started this series, I got a fair amount of people asking me to talk about the brave little. Mayor, you are gonna be fucking distracting. In my files. It's amazing. The 1987 Disney film about oh. an animated toaster. It was Disney? It was Disney? I don't fucking know that was Disney. I would have thought Blues or something. No way. You gotta fucking look that up. The rights to the book were acquired by Disney in 1982. Oh my god. Okay, whatever. Fine, fine. Okay, fine, fine. Don't care. Doesn't matter. And his friends searching for their long lost owner. I remember liking this movie okay, but I don't remember anything especially dark in it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So I like these nostalgia critic. I've watched a lot of his videos and stuff. Uh, there's some dumb drama about him. I don't fucking know. But, uh, he's, he's got a lot of content that's entertaining to me. So. Aside from this scene. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 So, uh, I, I know <laughs> this fucking movie. Okay, I know <laughs> this fucking movie. So it's really weird having him say, "I don't remember it being <laughs> like." What are you talking about? That's why it was so great. That's why I was obsessed with it. It's because it's so fucking twisted. On the surface, Great Little Toaster appears to be a family-friendly film. Because it is, but whatever. And I stand by. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. For the most part. Oh, please. Kids need that kind of shit. It will be about a group of appliances. Well, it's nice to know he's not autistic. He's left alone in a cabin for so long they go searching for their master, who used to be a little boy but is now a grown man, as the usual effect. God. Seriously. I think autistic kids would get a lot out of this fucking movie. Actually, I remember even when I was six years old that it had a little bit more of a mature feel to it. Yes, it's about big-eyed objects with cute voices, and yes, there's a lot of bouncing music. But there's also a sense that a harsh reality is always around the corner. Take this scene early on when the electric blanket is <laughs> remembering what it was like to have the master come home. So it's all loud, fucking... bright, and colorful like you would expect, but then... Hey. Yeah, he's talking about it weird. <sighs> bright and colorful, like, what are you talking about? It's... Okay, so it's official. The Nostalgia Critic is not autistic. <laughs> He's not on the spectrum at all. No, that's not a scary scene, but it is a rough one. There's a lot of quiet moments where nobody... Oh god, this is weird as shit. Oh my god. Ugh. It's a rough scene. What are you talking about? A rough scene? He calls that a rough scene? What the hell? It's a haunting scene. It, it's, it, it's, it's reality, you know. Settling in. That's not rough. No, that's not a scary scene, but it is a rough one. There's a lot of quiet moments where nobody talks, or even sometimes oh, yeah. the music just shuts off. Yeah, and, and that's that's one of the big things that's amazing about this movie. It has so many quiet moments. You know, a lot of kids' movies they try spam the kids with like stuff 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 that's happening the old time stuff that's happening and that's horrible it's horrible in fact that's part of why I didn't like a lot of fucking other movies as a kid and, and I grew up and uh, I was born in 1988 <laughs> if 
<laughs> by the way. 88. <laughs> but all the movies, even then, like, so many of them were loud and stuff was happening all the time. But, but this movie was, was a, a quiet movie. So he's got that right. And that, it's like one of the most important things about this movie, is that the way they handle silence. It shuts off and somebody will just feel bad. Yeah, they, they like let you sit with these feelings and these thoughts. It creates a relatability for kids. Like they know it's not gonna lie and say everything is just great all the time. When something happens that's a downer, it's gonna take the time to let it feel like a downer. It starts off on kind of a harsh note. The air conditioner, played by Phil Hartman doing a Jack Nicholson voice. <laughs> hey, I'm real scared there, Kirby. What are you gonna do? Suck me to death? I guarantee you, Hartman improvised that. This is the guy who wrote for Pee Wee. <laughs> uh, I love Pee Wee as a kid too. Strong. Two things the center always looks for on a mermaid: a belly button and a watch. <laughs> what? 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 Oh, I gotta, I gotta replay that. What the fuck? This is the guy who wrote for Pee Wee. Now, Pee Wee, there's two things missing from this drawing. Two things the center always looks for on a mermaid. A belly button and a watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's fucking amazing. Holy shit. Kids these days, man, they are missing out. Ugh. Pointless for them to go look for the master. because he wasn't given enough attention by the master and essentially blows himself up. I like being stuck in this stupid hole. <laughs> it's my fuck, shut up! I don't like seeing it cut like that. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because the, the way they build it up, you, you can't just cut, cut, cut t into it. It, yeah, it doesn't work. And in fact, that's one of the problems I'm having with my fucking videos. Is that, like, even though I fuck around and waste a lot of time, like, the pacing of it is part of what makes it work to me, and so I'm like, god damn it! <laughs> All they had to do was just have them taunt the main character so they could do the usual follow your dreams message, but instead, they just leave you <laughs> with this guy pretty much on the verge of death. And this is before- They say on the verge of death, but as a kid watching that, he's, he's dead. He's 100% dead, and they don't give a shit! It's amazing! They don't care. Like, the way that they just- the way that they process him having blown up like that is- Fascinating as shit. Or the journey even starts. There's always that sense of harshness looming over everything. Take this scene where they're trying to get across a waterfall. They all drop, leaving the vacuum behind, and he jumps in to save them. Okay. At least, I'm sure that's what the script called for. But this is the way they show it. Fucking amazing scene. Oh my god. I fucking hated it. Well, not this part. This part I always love. It's loved. like they want to trick you into thinking- it, it was the part, right? Like, after he backs up, and then he like it's quiet, and then he goes vroom, and I fucking hated it every time. It's like a fucking jump scare. Fucking hated it, but loved that it was in this movie. Everybody's dead, and he's just left alone forever. He does jump in and eventually God. save them, like you would expect. But I remember this moment of him just standing there alone more than when they were rescued. As a kid, I've seen a scene like this a million times, but this, this I haven't seen as often. It's not needed for the story. So you can cut it out and miss nothing it, else. It's needed for the story, by the way. Absolutely needed for the story. They could cut it out, but it shows a really important aspect of Kirby. He's being this grumpy little fucking I don't want to go do this and we're being dumb. Oh, you guys are dumb. I don't want to do this. You know, he's doing that the whole time. And obviously we see little hints and pieces of him caring, obviously. But that moment is so important. For the character Kirby, it's so important. So no, they couldn't have fucking cut it out. It would have dampened the impression and the understanding that you get about him. He—he's a vacuum. When he's working, he's loud. You know, he's all the time, right? When he's doing his function, he's loud. But in this moment. All of the other fucking appliances gone. Just him. There's nothing but silence. Something that is like inherently something that he can't handle. But water. 
It's still roaring in the background. Water, of course, being like a really important thing to the fucking appliances because they're, <laughs> you know, they're electrical appliances. And so him sitting there alone with the only sound not coming from him, not coming from the other appliances, not coming from his function, but from the water. It's huge. It's important. They couldn't have cut that out. You could cut it out and miss nothing essential. What? <laughs> nothing essential. What the hell do you think all this is? I hate when people talk like that about art and stuff. Like, uh, you know, it's important. You want every part of the art to add and support the overall piece. You cut the rest, right? Because it's just bullshit, pointless bullshit. But then people, you know, like him, but not just him, other critics and even artists, they like, they go too far. And they might overanalyze, like he is, and see a scene like that and say, oh, well, that could be cut. It's not essential. But it is. It's essential to understand Kirby. And in a lot of movies nowadays, people have that belief where, like, little moments like this are just a waste of time. Even though they're so important to supporting a character. It's, it's an essential scene. The stakes feel so much higher. Which is why it's essential. Like what help makes the film unique. With that said, it is mostly happy moments. There's upbeat songs, cute mm. one-liners, colorful characters they discover. A lot of it is business as usual. Mm. Like me, you don't remember these moments. See, this is so weird. I've never really listened to other people talk about this movie. That's as much. They've done fine. I mean, the characters are likable enough, and it goes the route you would think a movie like this would go. No, it does not. Totally no, it does not. It 100% does not go the way you'd think it would go. It, it, like, if you've never seen this movie, and you're watching this, and you're hearing this story, it 100% does not go the way you think it'll fucking go. I mean, technically, I guess it does, but no. No, 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 no. And that is like a central fucking aspect of this entire fucking movie. It does not go the way you think it would go. Of a pass if it kept this attitude all throughout. Because it is what I think everybody would expect. When no. it wants to go dark, though, it doesn't just go foreboding. It goes straight up horror. God. I do not understand. Yeah, kept this attitude. It is what I think everybody would expect. No, it's not. It's so not. This movie is not what you would expect. Like... You, you see this, and you're gonna expect something. Like, all the clips, everything he's talking about, you see that, and that's what you expect. You expect this, you know? You don't expect what's there. When the movie wants to go dark, though, it doesn't just go foreboding, it goes straight up horror film. First they enter the woods and discover some scary- I mean, kinda. God, I can't believe I'm fucking nitpicking every fucking dumb thing about this. It doesn't go straight up horror, it's like referencing horror. It uses, in, 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 in like these, these horror moments that he's talking about, it uses super basic tropes, like of course this tree that looks like a monster. It uses these basic tropes that kids have seen a million fucking times in like Looney Tunes and Disney and like, you know, other fucking movies and shit. It uses those specifically to reference to the kid this kind of scary shit that they're seeing in all these other shows. It's not going horror. It's talking about horror. He's, uh, okay, that's not too bad. But it all goes hardcore when the toaster has a dream about his young master. Huh? Hard? It seems pleasant enough. But again, there's always that feeling. What the hell do you mean it goes hardcore with the fucking dream? Fucking oh god, that was. Oh, the hell? Why is this bothering me so much? It, it's interesting. This is good for me. I'm glad I'm filming this. But what the fuck do you mean it goes hardcore? It doesn't go hardcore with the dream. It's a psychopath. It goes hardcore when they go to the junkyard. That's when it goes hardcore. 
This is super important for me right now. Because I need to figure out how, how like normal people see things like this. Because I don't know how I fucking see it. Of course, he's, he's writing what he's saying. He's not just kind of flowing with it. So there's a level of, like, masking kind of going on. Like, he's intentionally making this for his crazy fucking channel that's popular and shit. A lot, a lot of people, and he's done it for a long time. So, so he's, there's, there's, like, an artistic, like, lens that he's trying to do this in, to be fair. But there's thanks to the nostalgia critic that I ever watched The Secret of Nim. Thank God. Thank you so fucking much for fucking introducing me to that fucking movie. Secret of Nim is insane. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Nostalgia critic, but you, you are not. <laughs> you are not my people. <laughs> my people are fucking autistic as fuck, and he's not. <laughs> he's so not autistic. This seems pleasant enough, but again, there's always that feeling, uh, something's coming, I'm grabbing my teddy bear to squeeze. And suddenly, you're greeted with this. <sighs> God. The backgrounds get distorted, everything tries to kill him, he's dropped into a bathtub, and then he wakes up. What the hell was that? <laughs> I know, right? None of this even plays. Such a weird way to, like, talk about that scene to normal people. It doesn't, it doesn't capture the gravity of it at all. Like, at all. He has such a shallow understanding of this movie. The backgrounds get distorted, everything tries to kill him, he's dropped no into shit, a bathtub, it's a nightmare. and then he wakes up. What the hell was that? I mean, I know, right? that, like, that little clip is, is, is a good clip to add in there. But, like, the rest of the framing that he did for this, that scene, it does not communicate that properly at all. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't... This even plays into the story! Oh god, shut the fuck up. I know, right? None of this even plays into the story! Yes, it does. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. It... Oh my god. Oh my fucking god. Oh my fucking god. None of it plays into the story? How many times have you seen it? What, like two times? Maybe three? You fucking watch it like three fucking times? My fucking god. My life. <laughs> My hell. My fucking hell is this. I guess you could argue the drop into the tub might tie into sacrificing himself later. Oh, we'll <laughs> get to that. Fucking. <laughs> He's fucking great. I'm like, throw that out there. <laughs> you guess? Maybe? And in terms of story, this is another scene you could cut and not miss. Oh my god. No. Oh my. Oh my fucking god. No. Just no. I can't even... No. 100% no. You cannot fucking cut that fucking nightmare from the brave little fucking toaster and have it still fucking work. <laughs> In like the most shallow, basic fucking bitch ass fucking way. Yes, you could. Just like the Kirby scene. You know what you could cut in that movie? And it would still fucking play out the same. The stupid fish song. But even that has to be there. My fucking god. Why the hell does that upset me so much? Because he's so wrong. That's why. Nobody fucking understands this movie. At least not the way I do. Okay. It's like torture. This is torturing me. This is like torture to me, okay? You could argue the drop into the town oh even plays into the story and not miss anything god. important. It just gives the film an edge that, no. I don't know, is kind of welcomed in something I as mean, Oh my god. It just kind of gives it an edge. No. No. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. And he's saying it's kind of welcome, which, that's true. 
a lot of it really is just the characters being cute and getting into antics. So when something <sighs> this intense does <laughs> pop up, it is a legit surprise. <laughs> But it's also not out of place. If this was the only scene like this, it would be odd. But there are several more. After the blanket gets blown away in a storm, the lamp uh, forcefully gets struck by lightning. So they get forcefully gets struck by lightning? What a weird After way to put the that. the blanket gets blown away in a storm, the lamp forcefully gets struck by lightning so they can get power again. Mm -hmm. And they all nearly drown to death in, again, a rather intense moment. Blanket, I'm not scared. <sighs> Death is just a warm sleeping bag trying to strangle you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh. Okay. They're saved by a repairman, or so they think. They're taken to a spare part shop in his monster truck. <laughs> because I'll raise you more random. It's not random. <laughs> I mean. Uh, the monster truck's important. <laughs> I'm autistic as fuck, dude. <laughs> the, the monster truck is important. This guy, he collects appliances and he takes them apart and shit to sell the parts, right? He, he doesn't care about the appliances. He doesn't care about the machines. He doesn't care about the stuff. He only cares about what it can do for him. And what it does for him this makes him feel more powerful. Makes him feel bigger and stronger. Because he's he's like this chubby, kind of goofy, dorky, weird, sleazy kind of guy. And he wants to feel powerful. Like that. Big wheels. Big distance between him and everybody else. Power. Huge. You know? You have to notice it. So to him, that's how he uses technology. <laughs> they make me laugh. <sighs> They're not so safe when a customer asks for a blender motor. This little blender is literally running for his life until he's found and gutted like a snuff film. <laughs> is this like Johnny Number Five getting beaten in short circuit too? <laughs> if any part of this thing was human, this would be a hard R. I don't even know what half those things are. I just know they're gory as shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That other scene, it gets is when it gets rough. <laughs> Not this one. It gets rough <laughs> with the fucking master. It doesn't appear, <laughs> but this one he doesn't call rough. <laughs> uh. The appliances sing a song pretty much confirming they're a horror film. Like a movie. And incorporate some really creative designs, fun colors, and shadows. After the radio gets picked up to be. Fun colors? Fun colors? What fucking psychotic world does this guy live in? Where the fucking B movie fucking song is fun colors. Gutted next, the appliances band together and decide to break some rules to scare the shit out of him. <laughs> Time story! We'll do it! Something I love about the fact that the customer essentially sees all these things come to life, break through the walls, <laughs> and has absolutely no reaction to it. Just wondering if you got my radio tubes. <laughs> also, hail Satan, I guess. Love that guy too. He's like one of the best, just sort of throwaway characters. When they finally get to the city, they think their master is at. Which, by the way, I love the design of this place. It's like a mix of Saint Canard and Bay Pig in the city. They discover he grew up and, ironically, is taking his girlfriend to his childhood cabin where all his appliances mm -hmm. aren't. When we get to his they don't discover and that, but. Number Kajillion, the new appliances, don't like them and send them to the dumpster to die. They're sent to the local garbage dump. He jumps over, like. Them meeting the new appliances is also another really fucking important scene. I mean, every fucking scene of this fucking movie is important as shit. But he just kind of glosses over that. It's honestly one of the creepiest fucking scenes of the whole fucking thing. He just, just fucking glossed over it, I guess. Once again, something is trying to kill him. 
this time. It's a giant magnet sending all the forgotten garbage, which, yes, are alive, to be pounded into a dead key. Mm. And this isn't like when they're dead, they're dead. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Mm. Hurt me while I it. But this song, ironically called Worthless, is easily the best one. Yeah. It's super catchy, the lyrics are clever, and as you'd imagine, it's pretty damn dark. They all sing about how they used to be valued until they were abandoned, and now their last words are frantically singing about how they used to have it all. Once took a text into a wedding. He kept forgetting his own I don't like seeing this all cut up like this. <laughs> it bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> she repeats it. She says it twice. She says it twice. It has to be said twice. Why would you... Like, what fucking psychopath would include her singing that and not include her singing it twice? I'm sorry. I don't know why that bothers me. I have to figure this out. Why? Why would you... The fact that she repeats it is so important. That's the kind of shit I'm talking about. So many people these days, they, they think all this dumb shit it has no meaning, but it does. And so, of course, him trying to be efficient and do this fucking shit for the normal fucking people, he fucking cuts her repeating it. But her repeating it is... Fucking important. Damn it. No. 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 How can somebody fucking... Like... It's so important. Oh my god. Like, okay. I'm aware there is a difference between familiarity you know like obviously i'm familiar with her fucking repeating it and so you know that's part of it but it's not it's not it's not it so like pay attention to how this feels when she sings okay pay attention to how that felt and then It has an effect of focusing you on what she's really trying to say. If nothing else, because she sings it slightly differently, she's insisting of how important this experience was to her. He obviously didn't love this movie, duh. But how can somebody fucking watch this and cut that? Her saying it twice emphasizes how fucked up this is. So if he's actually trying to showcase how fucked up this movie is, why would he cut a part that specifically makes it more powerful? It, 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 it diminishes his case. As the viewer, when you're watching it, you can tell that the song's been going on. So you're just, you can tell you're just getting the snippet of a song. But if you start it at the beginning, She's aware that it's like the last time she'll be telling that story. She's telling it to them. So they're down there. They're listening to her. You know? The details. They're not what matters. Just that it happened. See, they're listening to her, so she is telling them. She knows. She's not fucking surprised at all when the stupid thing comes to fuck kill her. Her final words. Once took a text into a wedding. So obsessed with it. You know, and the rest is just for herself. Why would you not show that? talking about how fucking crazy this fucking movie is 
And you don't let the movie do what it does? To make it so crazy? And as you'd imagine, it's pretty damn dark. I come from Casey, Missouri. See, like, he started that one right. He made the right choice in showing the other cars singing along with it. Like that's important. It's important to the to the feel of that of that little song. So why would you fucking show her song and not show her repeating it? It's so fucking important. It helps the disturbingness of her song set in for us, the fucking, his fucking viewers singing about how they used to have it all. But he fucking neuters it. He fucking neuters it. Actually, okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one who loves this song. It's the best song in the whole fucking movie. After that happy tune of death, the master finds the appliances there. After the TV recommends, he goes to the dump to save them. Funny. To the climax that, you guessed it, is pretty damn intense. The magnet tries to get all the appliances squashed down. He's surprisingly a good villain because he never talks. You have no idea what his deal is. You just know he <laughs> wants them dead and will even sacrifice a human life to do it. <laughs> That's exactly what happens as the master uh, gets stuck uh, in the rubble. That's like the funniest thing. Like, this fucking magnet, dude. <laughs> I fucking love this magnet. ...is about to be destroyed along with the rest of them. Everything goes red like it's the end of Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. And the dude is screaming at the top of his lungs so he isn't squished into a bloody pancake. Jesus, look how this is edited. I mean, it's not, but, okay. The master, but as you'd also guess, he's okay in the end. Still, man, can't imagine many kids were having fun not. watching a big-eyed protagonist go through this. Like, if you hadn't seen this movie, and you were watching his review, you would not say it went the way you thought it would. Because you would not fucking think that some fucking suicidal, sacrificial bullshit would have fucking come into it. Like, that's the whole point. That's the fucking point! As you'd guess, he does launch himself into the gear, saving the master, but as you'd also guess, he's okay in the end. That's not the true ending. <laughs> he dies. What toaster could go through this? Like, like just watch that. What toaster could experience those physical forces and be fixable? And the master wouldn't fix it. He wouldn't waste his time fixing it. Being the master, but it's like, because he would have had to rebuild the whole fucking thing. It wouldn't have been the toaster anymore. But the toaster wouldn't survive that. <laughs> Sorry, he just wouldn't. And like, the fucking the master would not have fucking found the toaster. Imagine you're a human in this position. Okay, just a normal, dumb, fucking college-aged human. Right? You're in this position, and the stupid thing stops. Do you go to investigate the gears to figure out why it stopped? Or... Do you assume some person running the stupid thing saw it, what was happening, and stopped it? He'd be too freaked out. He wouldn't go fucking look at the gears. He wouldn't have found the toaster. The whole point is that the master wouldn't know. But the master wouldn't know. It's the whole point. Everything about the movie sets this up to tell you 100% the toaster dies in this situation. And so as a kid, when it flips over to, oh, he's fixing him and shit, sure, you kind of get that basic, like, oh, okay, happy ending, you know, you found him, blah, 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 blah. But you're still left at the end of this movie. With like this weird feeling where it's like that that's not really how it ended though, is it? That's the toaster's heaven. It's the master caring enough about him to fix him. Compare this to say Coraline and return to Oz where there's either something scary or me That's what Coraline's supposed to be. That's why it's scarier, because it's supposed to be. This movie's not supposed to be that. It's about the emotional journey of these stupid fucking appliances 
trying to deal with the concept of death. So it's a serious movie. That's why the horror theme is even there, is because the horror deals with death and murder and shit. That's why they have all these quiet moments. That's why they have these themes of sacrifice and shit. Bright stuff is bright and happy moments are happy. No. This scene is the most disturbing fucking scene in the entire fucking movie. It's the most horrifying, fucked up scene. This scene is intended to give you context for the rest of the movie. It sets up the themes, it sets up, like, what you should expect. It tells you outright that this movie may present lies to you, but it's not going to shy away from the truth. The idea of something bad being around the corner is always in the back of your head. Because of that All scene. Kids movies, you... He's not implying that. He's implying that was a good scene. But that stupid fucking blanket flying down the fucking stairs, this scene is like intentionally telling you things are not as they seem. And literally because of that, it's the most fucked up, fucking creepy, disturbing scene. Look at his fucking face, dude. That is creepy as shit. Oh, it's happy and shit. It's the brightest scene in the whole fucking movie, by the way. I mean, unless you can't like the fish shit. For a story that almost by design has to talk down to you, it doesn't talk down to you too much. It lets you know you're not always safe, so that when you do get to the pleasant moments, you enjoy them all the more. I don't know why he would put those two together as like an example of, <laughs> as an example of that. <laughs> you'll care about those two. <laughs> like, you'll care. Pleasant moments. Not a pleasant moment. I mean, it is, but it's yeah, not. Like a lot of films. I think the rougher moments are the ones we find ourselves appreciating. More. <sighs> it is. I'm gonna stop. I remember, so you don't have. See, so have some dumb, cute little thing at the end here. Huh. What are you gonna do? Suck me to death? Ugh. Well, that was upsetting. People don't understand this movie the way I do, at least. Like, you could say all of my crazy shit is because of this movie. Even my love for turtles comes from this movie. You know? They have a master, too.